A Chinese entrepreneur, Ren Zhengfei, who was a former Chinese army soldier who started importing foreign telecom equipment into China, founded Huawei. Ren, who was an engineer by training, started making his own equipment and launched Huawei in 1987 from his studio apartment in Shenzhen. Over the next three decades, Huawei would become one of the world's most important telecom manufacturers. By 2010, 80% of the world's top 50 telecom companies worked with Huawei, with Huawei selling its products to over 170 countries around the globe. It seemed like nothing could stop Huawei, but the US government decided to give it their best shot. On December 1, 2018, the US government, while transferring planes at the Vancouver International Airport in Canada, arrested Meng Wanzhou, the daughter of the Huawei founder. She was charged with violating US sanctions by selling equipment to Iran and was held under house arrest for three years in Canada. During this time, the US government launched a full force attack on Huawei. Overnight, the US government passed sanctions forbidding any US company from working with Huawei, and the US government even convinced most of Europe to follow America's lead and stop working with Huawei. To be honest, the US sanctions were incredibly effective. Huawei was forced to sell its main smartphone brand because it couldn't access advanced microchips. By 2021, revenues declined by more than 30%. And by 2022, net profits collapsed by 70%. Ren Zhengfei, the Huawei founder who grew up admiring the United States, now realized his company was fighting for its life. This statement marked a turning point for Huawei, and here was the first strategy on how China is surviving US sanctions. Instead of exporting around the world, China has shifted to domestic consumption. After the US government sanctioned the company and destroyed its revenue, Huawei began developing entirely new industries. It helped build the world's most advanced shipping port in Tianjin. It started using its 5G network to advance the coal mining industry in China and even expanded into the booming EV industry, something even Apple has not done yet. Moreover, as this graph illustrates, within five years, Huawei was able to shift its revenue sources dramatically. Today, nearly 70% of Huawei's revenues come directly from mainland China, as the company has expanded its reach into a multitude of new industries. Here is where the second strategy for China comes into play. Huawei used these American sanctions as fuel and portrayed itself as a national champion that prioritizes serving the needs of China. As you can imagine, this branding would go on to become very popular within China, helping Huawei expand and become even more popular amongst Chinese nationals. After three years of house arrest, the US government eventually dropped all charges against Meng Wanzhou. Overnight, the founder's daughter was sent on a plane back to China. When she emerged on the Chinese runway in September 2021, she expressed her gratitude and said something that immediately solidified Huawei's deep connection to the Chinese people and country. Over the last three years, I've come to understand this better. An individual's fate, a corporation's fate, and the country's fate are all intertwined. Our motherland is our strongest backing. Meng was seen as a national hero in China, someone who stood up against the US government for three years, eventually winning her freedom. After Meng's return to China, Huawei continued its impressive turnaround. Huawei's sales last year were over $100 billion, twice that of American tech firm Oracle. Huawei is just half the size of Samsung, Korea's leading tech company, but incredibly, Huawei now outspends it on research and development. Huawei once again started producing advanced smartphones, and after trailing Apple's sales by double digits in early 2020, the company's smartphone sales have made a resounding comeback. As US companies like Microsoft are reducing their presence in China once again because of these sanctions, Huawei is now hiring all the former Microsoft engineers to join its expanding workforce. Finally, a new report from the Wall Street Journal dropped this week revealing Huawei is now set to release a new AI chip that will challenge NVIDIA's most powerful AI microchip. Chinese companies like Baidu and China Mobile are already in discussions to buy the chip. What we are witnessing here 
is Chinese companies coming closer to support each other and finding ways to collaborate and overcome these US sanctions. In a public speech last year, Ren Zhengfei, the Huawei founder, recalled that one of his executives stated, America doesn't understand that with this blow, they are turning the biggest supporter of the US into its largest detractor. It's a powerful quote and shows what a missed opportunity the United States made with China. The two nations have been trading partners for over 50 years and the relationship has produced incredible results for both nations. But the old adage, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, seems to apply perfectly in this situation for both Huawei and China, who have overcome seemingly every challenge the US government has thrown their way. Now it's time to reveal China's third and final strategy to overcome US sanctions, and that is government support to any industry or company deemed crucial to the future development of China. This case study of Huawei is once again a prime example. Over the years, the Chinese government has handed out subsidies, tax credits and government contracts to rally support behind Huawei, quite simply because the future of China's development depends on Chinese companies not just surviving, but also pushing the limits of innovation. Another powerful case study to examine is the incredible rise of the Chinese EV industry. For most of this century, foreign brands have dominated China's car market. Every year, they sold millions of cars and earned billions of dollars in profits. Chinese consumers loved Buick, Volkswagen, BMW, Mercedes and Toyota and were happy to pay cash for the prestige of owning a brand that wasn't Chinese. One General Motors executive was quoted as saying, China is our forever profit machine. We can bank on an easy $2 billion dividend every year. But now that golden era is officially over, Sales and profits for foreign auto brands are vanishing, while auto executives in the US, Germany and Japan are stunned by the speed and intensity of these changes. However, what happened in the auto industry was a calculated move from the Chinese government, who at the turn of the century set out to become the top electric vehicle producer in the entire world. Without question, the Chinese government has helped achieve this goal. Just last month, for the first time in history, more than half of the passenger vehicles sold in China were new energy vehicles, reaching 879,000 units, a year-on-year -year increase of 37%. This marks the first time new energy vehicles have surpassed fuel vehicles in monthly sales in China and shows how mainstream EV vehicles have become and that fuel cars are now the minority in China. Once again, the Chinese EV industry was fueled directly by the Chinese government, who gave out subsidies and tax credits to both Chinese and foreign companies. I mean, why else would Elon Musk build his gigafactory in China? But before anyone claims this strategy is unfair, it's important to note that this is simply a best practice used by nations around the world, including the United States. When Joe Biden passed the CHIPS Act in August 2022, the US government pledged over $50 billion in subsidies to US semiconductor companies. That's why every major US semiconductor company is currently expanding its production, knowing that the government support is there to push the industry forward. But here's what the US government failed to realize. China is willing to spend billions more than the United States in order to achieve this goal. 